Thank you. Wow, it's been an extraordinary evening. We learned how our uh, law enforcement behaves after hours. <laughs> we learn how to cure diseases. We learn how our scientists fail all the time why they refuse to tell us. <laughs> and we've learned about elephants and jewelry making and what am I going to talk about? There's nothing left. So let's talk about making cookies. Here's how I make them. Put your dough together, right? Then you roll it out. You can add chocolate chips or raisins, whatever you like. And then we put them into these shapes that we enjoy. <laughs> and then we stick them in the oven. By the way, only about 25% of the dough makes it to the oven. The rest gets eaten before it makes it to the oven. And if you are lucky enough to make it through the oven, then we look for purpose in our lives. <laughs> Freshly out of the oven. And therefore, we're looking for enlightenment. <laughs> and maybe we do that through tradition of staying on the circle <laughs> or a tribe or it could be your origin maybe it's your heritage or roots perhaps it's culture that's a good one and maybe it's new culture he is actually a wonderful artist who works out of London So, what is your mission? You're going to graduate pretty soon. And as we go through this journey in our lives, on a daily basis, we have all of these emotions. Like tonight, there's sadness, there's anger, there's anxiety, there's excitement. Hundreds of these emotions on a daily basis. And what happens with these emotions is the memorable ones end up going into the neocortex of our mind, which is the largest part of your brain, and they technically become your operating system. In a sense, our memories and what we experience on a daily basis really become who we are, if you really think about it. So if you have wonderful memories, and good things that go on, then technically you are a happier person. Seems to make sense. But as we get older, we all have this invisible backpack we carry around. No wonder a lot of the older people are kind of walking like this. They're carrying all this stuff around, right? So we carry a lot of that around with us. But at the end, really all we have is our memories, right? very important for us. So whether they're good, they're bad, or ugly, they are our memories. And those experiences help us create who we are and what we do. So therefore, good decisions come from experience, right? And experiences come from making a lot of bad decisions as Alex does. <laughs> so creativity is really the accumulation of all of these things that we experience. And that's what we put to work. So imagination, I believe, is as important as literacy. It's not necessarily about what we learn out of a book. It's what we do with it and how we figure out to do it different. 
or maybe put a different spin on it. Imagination is the new currency. It does have value. And I'll talk about this a little bit more down the line. So Picasso said that all children are born artists. The problem is to stay as an artist. It's an interesting one because we are all born with creativity inside of us. And when you do an art project or you hand a brush or color pencils to a young child, it's amazing the stuff they come up with because they have no fear or expectations. They just let it all flow out. So, starting your education today, 2065, and we truly don't know what the world looks like five years from now. I mean, look how rapidly things are changing. Just in my own lifetime, just in, in the last five years. It's incredible. So, third of the people in the world are children. And how do we know that they want to be like us? What makes us so sure that even our education system is the way that they want to learn and be educated and deal with the world? I don't know if we have the answer for that. The biggest changes in the economy we don't even know about. They'll be completely different if we base it on what's happened in our world in the last 10 years. So therefore, play. <laughs> Stay creative, use your imagination, and play. Because that's where the newness comes from. I want to share a little history with you. So in this country, we've spent about the last 60 years, and until very recently, building things quicker and in some ways faster than any other place on the planet. As a matter of fact, after World War II, we were the only act in town because Europe was destroyed, Japan was destroyed, Russia was destroyed. So the, for the rest of the world, they had to buy their goods and services from us to survive. I know this, I grew up in Michigan, I worked in some of those car factories when I was a teenager. Well, that's how we built our middle class. We all drove one of these, or maybe it was a Ford. We all stayed here. That was the only option. And they didn't have a spa, but the bed had this little coin thing you put a quarter in and it vibrated. <laughs> that was the spa. And we were happy. We all shopped here. Remember my dad going and putting tires on his car and then my mom would buy lingerie on the fifth floor. We don't shop like that anymore, do we? We all ate here. We were happy. This says sold over one million. This is an old slide. I think they've sold a few more of those. And we came up with some great products, by the way. Spam. This sells in 400 countries around the world. As a matter of fact, in Hawaii, you can buy it at Burger King. Surfers like this stuff. We canned everything. We actually didn't discover the can. Napoleon did during the war. But when we got a hold of this stuff, we learned how to can everything. So everything went into inside of a can. This was our dinner. Well-balanced meal, right? It was technology. Basically stuck this stuff in the oven, give it a good 15 minutes, and you had the perfect meal. A lot of us grew up this way because we were so busy making stuff and trying to build our middle class, right? So then, guy named Percy Spencer invented the microwave. Because now we didn't have to wait 15 minutes. 
we can just stick it in this box and zap it and within a couple of minutes we had our meal. By the way, he worked for the government and he was a scientist, kind of like Alex. <laughs> and he <laughs> discovered this stuff. This is true, you go look it up. He was in a lab working on a project and he had a candy bar in his pocket that literally mel melted from radiation. And other than ruining his suit, he figured out what to do with a microwave. So this shaved about 12 minutes out of our lives, which was really good at the time. So then, we would go here and eat. And at some point we thought, I don't want to order like a large Coke and a Big Mac and a fry. It takes too long. So they came up with this combo menu. Because we didn't have time. We were busy. So you just walk up to the counter. You ask for a number one. <laughs> but then, one day, we thought, man, I don't even want to get out of my car. It's too much work to walk in here and order number one. <laughs> so we invented the drive-thru. <laughs> where we would walk up to these beautiful little speakers and repeat everything 11 times. <laughs> right? And then you go up to the window and somebody chucks the burger at you. And then you woof this stuff in the car. Because <laughs> we were so busy. We did a number to our food system. And I think basically this slide <laughs> sums it up, sort of fed up. We maxed out. We maxed out when it came to food. I've got three boys, they all went to Sage. Consumption machines. That's what we were producing, right? So then, all of a sudden, our focus was greater with objects than relationships. Happened all over our country. But then, some really smart developer came up with a wonderful idea called the storage unit. <laughs> Where you can take all your stuff, you can rent one of these things, and you can put it inside, you get a key. You can lock the stuff in so nobody would get to it. <laughs> then you would go out and you would buy more stuff. <laughs> Reload. The storage unit, American invention. Did you know the average marriage is 8.7 years and the average mortgage is 30 years for a, how, for a home? So technically we have a better relationship with our mortgage than we do with our spouse. <laughs> so then, as Americans, 4.5% of the world population we ended up consuming about 25% of all the goods and services. It's pretty good. <laughs> if this was the Olympics, we'd get the gold medal. So when they talk about the economy going bad, maybe we just maxed out. We bought everything there was. We ate everything there was. Maybe we just maxed out. It took us 300 years to get there, by the way. But maybe we maxed out. Problem is that as we went through this, everything in this country became formula oriented. Our food system, our car system, everything. All of our products and goods. Problem with formulas are that they have no empathy, they have no emotion, they have no heart. Somewhere along the line, we lost touch 
with human reality of who we are and what's important to us. So, I'm not a demographic, I'm not a number, I'm not a barcode. I think this next generation definitely relates to that. We're not robots. We're people with feelings. This is Albert Einstein. So I will promise you that mass culture in America is basically breaking down. And when it breaks down, it doesn't just dissipate, it breaks down into these smaller bites. So we're going from a mass nation to a niche nation. It's happening right now. As a matter of fact, one size doesn't fit all anymore. <laughs> we're not sheeps. It's about personalization, customization, localization, and not homogenization. Localization is a big word in all of our businesses, not just real estate. I will promise you that every CEO and board member of every national food chain in America, whether it's McDonald's or Applebee or Cheesecake Factory, is trying to figure out how to grow because they're maxed out. People don't necessarily want another Applebee. It's not a game changer. <laughs> it's not cultural. So, you are the brand now. When you come out of high school, you're the brand. Not somebody else is your brand. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather buy your tomatoes in a grocery store where they've been shipped out, genetically modified, shipped out from New Jersey. Nothing against New Jersey, but <laughs> it's not as nice as California. Wrapped in some silicone material that's going to kill you and the environment. <laughs> or would you rather buy your tomatoes from your local farmer where he actually hands you the tomato and he tells you about the growing season and talks to you about the tomato. All of a sudden, it's not even about buying the tomato. <laughs> it's about the relationship, isn't it? And by the way, who cares if it costs an extra 10 cents? <laughs> Nobody raised their hands. I'm impressed. Is that sexy? Or is that sexy? It's called, oh. People invent stuff. We can't stop them. The government tries to stop us from inventing things all the time. It's called regulations. That's what our first speaker was up against. They wouldn't let her invent and come up with new solutions. It's a real problem, but people are going to continue to do this, right? That's a good one. <laughs> so, curiosity does matter. Curiosity matters. Curiosity is what's made this country advance. We're not about the labor force anymore. We're about innovation, imagination. That's what put us ahead. We, we invented technology. We invented the automobile. We invented the airplane. Imagination and creativity is the future. The next generation of goods and services are going to be from a lot of our local makers. Smaller companies. Not necessarily the big companies. How about this guy? Guy comes from PayPal, develops this electric car. You mean to tell me that GM, who had the world car market for 70 years, couldn't figure out how to come up with an electric car? What about Ford? 
or those dudes in Germany that make Mercedes. They couldn't figure it out? It doesn't make sense. This guy didn't even go to auto school. And look at the valuation. It's like four times or three times higher than Chrysler, right? Innovation. How about this guy? Game changer. Many places don't like him. But it makes sense because people decide. You guys been in a cab ride to LAX? You're sitting back of a cab. It's got that little window. You can't even look through it. I feel like I'm in jail. They should pay me to ride up there. Uber makes sense. So in my business, the biggest problem these days is parking. I will tell you 20%, I'll go on record, of our customers now Uber. Because they all drink. Because <laughs> it's easier. It makes sense. It's actually cheaper. How about these guys? Now you can make money renting your home while you're on vacation. Pretty good idea. The hotel industry hates them. It doesn't matter. They're going to keep growing. Look at the valuation. They don't even own any real estate. Interesting. Now, computers have no imagination. People do. I'm convinced. I really am convinced. The other thing that I'm convinced about is that what can be accomplished on the computer has less and less value. When we go to do our taxes in our organization, they send them to India. They really do. Because you have MBAs there working for $5 an hour. We can't afford to work for $5 an hour. Anything that can be done on a computer has smaller value. You can't create imagination on a computer necessarily. A good example is what's happened in China. They can make everything, but they haven't really designed or created anything that I'm aware of. There you go. This guy was pretty smart. <laughs> Look what happened to him. Oh, jumped. Okay. This is a guy that's really creative. He really uses his imagination, right? If you get an opportunity to take a bite of the apple, don't just chomp away at it. <laughs> Create something. Make the world map or something. Right? Create value. It's not just about the apple anymore, is it? I think they messed up on Africa a little bit there, but <laughs> no, nobody will know. Okay, have no fear. Some of the earlier speakers talked about this. Take some risk. It's worth it. It does pay off. Right, Alex? <laughs> hey, I have to tell you a story. So, down in Mission Viejo Mall, there was a Saks Fifth Avenue. So one day, it was gone. And I heard Forever 21 went in there. So my original career was in the action sports industry. I was president of Quicksilver here locally. And so I was curious. Wow, 50,000 square foot of Forever 21. It's a lot of junk, right? <laughs> so. Got in my car, went down to Mission Viejo. I walked in. Wow. It was true. <laughs> 50,000 square foot of junk. As I'm pontificating my way through the aisles, there's this young lady and this young man, and there was a pair of jeans hanging there that was for $7.99. And so, Wow, I've made goods all over the world, really have. And I had no shame because we were looking for price and value. I honestly don't know where to go to make a pair of jeans, put the buttons, the snap, the zippers, pay somebody to build it, pay for the fabric, put it on the ship, ship it over here, pay the duty, put it on a truck, take it to my warehouse, 
put it in my system, pay somebody to take it upstairs, put it on the hanger, take it up, advertise it, and sell it for $7.99 and make some money. <laughs> it's gotta be an easier way. But that's what they did. By the way, I could tell the young couple weren't married because they looked happy. <laughs> but then, I sort of had a headache after I went through this Forever 21. And as you walk out of this Forever 21, there's a coffee shop outside, right? So I went to get my cup of coffee, and well, what do you know? The young girl and the guy, the happy couple, <laughs> were ordering coffee right in front of me. And she ordered a macchiato latte, ba 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 thing looked like Mount Fuji on top, right? <laughs> there was coffee in there somewhere. Six ninety five. <laughs> so now I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. She just spent seven ninety nine on a pair of jeans and she paid almost seven dollars for a cup of coffee. It was really interesting. But then I realized the fact that she gets to have that cup of coffee with her boyfriend who's trying to marry her <laughs> and the time they spent together and that experience has higher value than that pair of jeans that she bought for $7.99 that's going to make her butt look good for two weeks <laughs> and then she's going to wash it and it's going to disintegrate. But the memory of that cup of coffee is going to stay with her. Especially if he proposes. <laughs> right? So it's called intrinsic value. So when we were thinking about product, in business school, nobody talked to us about there's a line item for culture. Or there's a line item for intrinsic value. But these, have, these things have value. It's kind of like, you know, you go to Italy and they all have three-hour lunches. You just go, what the hell, don't these people work? And then you really realize it's intrinsic value. They know how to live. And I show up as an ugly American. I order my first course and second course, dessert. And, oh, can you bring my coffee too? And they're just like, oh, I get out of here. Because <laughs> I don't want to wait to order the coffee. They have three-hour lunches. When I went to buy one of these things, I guess it was like 10 years ago or so, I show up at the store and I noticed there was a camera in it. I'm like, what the hell? I don't want to, I already have a nice camera, I want a phone. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I can be a creative guy, but like, I just didn't get the camera thing in your phone. Like, this is a camera and this is a phone. <laughs> I was very happy with that. In my mind, I just kind of imagined something like that. <laughs> I just didn't get it. Why do I need a camera on my phone? It just seemed very retarded. <laughs> Today, I use my camera more than my phone. I hate talking on the phone. I look at it, and I see who's calling me, and I put... Delete. <laughs> I, I use it to text. I use it for email. I can turn the lights on and off at my house right now. I like to do that because it freaks my wife out. But... <laughs> I tell her, honey, if you want the lights to come on, just clap. And I hear her on the phone clapping and then I just hit that button. <laughs> oh. It's totally worth my AT&T monthly coverage. I can turn my jacuzzi on and off, that freaks her out too. I use it for everything except the telephone. So now imagine that somebody walking into an Apple store and, and says that I'm looking for a telephone with a camera in it. Like nobody talks like that. I tried, it didn't feel good. My point is we expect it. It's called the multi-layer experience. 
it's more like, what do you mean it doesn't have a camera? What do you mean it doesn't turn my jacuzzi on? But you're buying a phone. But we expect it to do all these other things. This next generation of our consumers expect these things. It's like when I was growing up and you bought a new automobile, power steering was an option. Remember that? I think it was an extra 80 bucks. I'm not sure if it was worth it, but power windows was an option. We used to have to do one of these things to get the window. <laughs> Today, you kind of expect it. That's what's happened to products and goods. So now, people want content in their lives, okay? I see a little bit of this reversal of roles going on. What's interesting is that people in other parts of the world have been doing yoga for about 4,000 years. <laughs> we opened one of the first yoga studios in Orange County at the camp. And I remember when I went to the counter at the City Hall, and they said, well, what is it? It wasn't in the book. Is it a school? I said, oh, no, no, it's not a school. I didn't want it to be a school because I couldn't park it. And then they said, well, is it a gym? Oh, no, it's not a gym. Well, what is it? It's yoga. Well, what do you do? You stand on your head. <laughs> Put it in the book. Isn't there a standing on your head section? So today, this is one of the largest practices in America. Again, it took us 300 years to figure it out. So, but maybe what this means is we're becoming more spiritual and focusing on things that are a little bit more important to us. And perhaps consumption is going somewhere else. Maybe we bought everything already. And other things are more important to us than just buying stuff, right? This is a parking lot at the camp. I just had to show you the parking lot. <laughs> Put a plan together, please. <laughs> Work hard every day, please. I'm talking to the parents. <laughs> Inspire, please. I believe in this, we can change the world. I know that this next generation for sure can change the world. They're gonna cure all diseases. They will, they will. And remember, imagination is not an end game, but it's a journey. Goodbye, thank you. <laughs>